Hey everybody, welcome to Rationable Interviews one more time. Today I have a very special guest, somebody I've been following for quite a while. I this is becoming a trend doing a lot of these interviews, but of course, the people I get on to interview here are people I admire and whose content I follow and who I think is doing some fantastic work. So today it's Krish Ashok and he is he is quite the renaissance man. He's written a book called Masala Lab. He's got an Instagram channel called Masala Lab. He has been debunking food myths and knows the science history and geography behind pretty much every form of Indian food there is, at least. I'm sure that it goes beyond that. The thing I'm focused most on is on the pseudoscience. But of course, Chris does this all alongside his day job where he works at TCS. Krish, welcome to the Rationable interview and let's get this show on the road. Thank you for having me. It's going to be a spicy conversation, I'm sure puns allowed. All right, so, <laughs> so, so first of all, just give me a little background. Like I'm sure I missed a whole bunch of stuff there, including of course your musicianship and we'll get back into that so that people can download your music on streaming platforms, etc. I've already added you on Apple music. So, but yeah, tell us a little bit more about yourself. So I'm a, I'm an engineer by training. I, it, electronic engineering and so on. And I've essentially at that point of time, I was also a semi-professional violinist, a Carnatic violinist at the time when I was graduating from engineering. And so the choice was either trying to do a full-time career in music or, or or engineering and so on. In a weird way, my, my father was smart about this. And he said, look, the problem with music is that very few people become very successful and the most of the rest of, most of the rest of them get nowhere. So <laughs> you might want to consider that and so on. So I ultimately ended up picking essentially software, which again, in the context of 1999, it was sort of like a interesting thing that you had to do. This is the early phase when software was sort of becoming the thing that a lot of engineers were doing, not necessarily just building houses or bridges or cars and so on, but software was a thing that everybody was getting into. And I picked it at that time because it was the most amount of money for the least amount of work, which therefore allowed me to figure out what I want to do, meaning that I had, which again, by the way, in 1999, getting Saturday and Sunday off was a big thing. Every yeah. other company worked six days a week. Yeah. Software worked five days a week. It was a big thing then. And so I said, look, I could do music on the weekends. That would give me a lot of time. And again, software is one of those things where, where if you get very good at it, you can do a lot in very little time. Get yourself a lot of free time to do other things. And, and it's, not, it's not true of mechanical engineering. No matter what you do, you can't build a car any faster. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But if you're really productive and if you're really good at it, and you can write source code like really, really fast. But then over over time, I began to like software. And over time, I just ended up being lucky because software ended up eating the world. I mean, yeah. everything is now software, right? And yeah, so car companies now hire more software engineers than mechanical engineers. So so that's <laughs> where we are now. So so that that's my work site. And I've been, I've been with TCS for about 24 years now. And I had one of the business units called Digital Workplace and so on. So that's been that journey. And then that journey has also taken me to, well, practically all of the major big countries in the world. We do business everywhere. And that has also meant that opportunity to, to explore food everywhere else. So sort of became a foodie. But I've been cooking since I was 13 or 14 years old. My mother had a, a transferable sort of job. And so I ended up cooking. From very, I was very young. And then I, when I went to the US, I had to sort of, I did the usual thing. I said, let us let me talk to all of these old ladies and get recipes. And then it struck me that they didn't think in terms of recipes. They just said, oh, you just add these things. How do you know? Is, is it quarter teaspoon or half teaspoon? I said, no, you add it till it smells right. Or add it till it feels right. <laughs> and it struck me that somehow this practical heuristic knowledge of how our grandmothers did cooking was not captured. I mean, all the cookbooks really just focused on recipes and forced people to think in terms of absolute ratios. And so that's just really not how people actually cooked. It's a series of heuristics that I began to realize that, well, each one of those heuristics was backed by science, at least most of them. Some pseudoscience seemed to have scripted. It's really quite interesting. 90% of the pseudoscience in the world of food comes from men. Really? Right? Who don't cook, who just pass judgment, who say, oh, this is good, that is good, and so on. Uh, Ayurveda, that, this, and all that. Grandmothers, mothers, they're basically dealing with practical knowledge in the kitchen. It's got to work. It's got to be tasty. And so, therefore, when they say that this is how much water you need to add, because et cetera, et cetera, they may not know it's to, say, account for evaporation loss and so on. They may not know that, but they know it works. So, there's that sort of practical knowledge that I said. Look, we need to take this practical knowledge and encode it and explain it with science, because that's how we'll make sure we don't lose it. 
Exactly. Right? Because what happens is that sometimes, like a few things, obviously crept in over the times. Like for example, this belief that you can cut a cucumber and then rub it and then it'll reduce its bitterness and so on. Yeah, uh, I've had that in the house quite a yeah, bit. Uh, clearly, it doesn't work. But at the end of the day, the idea of considering science to be merely just a way to ask questions down to its first principles till you understand it. Um, exactly. Till you get to a point where, yeah. I can derive all the rest from those first principles. So that was the goal of Masala Lab. And, and I was pleasantly surprised that nobody had written a book on the science of Indian cooking. And so the book did well and so on. And then my publisher said, you need to be on Instagram because all the food people are on Instagram. And so I said, okay, fine, let me create an Instagram <laughs> handle. I did about a year and a half ago. And then in the first one year or so, we would post a lot of like these algorithms of saying that, oh, here's how you can make 20 varieties of dal by just using one algorithm. Here's how you can make yogurt-based gravies. There's a kadi in Punjab. There's a kadi in Sindh. There's a kadi in Gujarat. There's a Polish in Kerala and there's a more Koramba in Tamil Nadu, they're all approximately roughly the same template, right? So there's a yogurt reduced with some sort of a starch binder and then you add spices or vegetables and that's it. That's basically what a yogurt-based gravy is. And again, what ended up happening is that lots of people would find it useful and say, oh, this is really useful because that way I can truly make like hundreds of variations as opposed to being tethered to one recipe. That was nice. But nine out of 10 people would then say, you're not supposed to heat yogurt. According to Ayurveda, it will become poison or so on. It's some to some effect. So they would watch my videos where I'm using a nonstick and say, oh, nonstick will cause cancer. Or they'd watch me put something in the microwave and say, oh, microwave, why are you eating? Why are you nuking your food with radiation and so on? And so it kind of struck me over the last, say, four or five months that it seemed like before we get down to making people's life easy by bringing in shortcuts and so on. So there's a certain... There's a certain gender angle to that as well. A lot of conveniences have historically been opposed by men. If you've seen the movie Great Indian Kitchen, yeah, it's the guys in the house who are like, no, no pressure cooker. I want on the wood-fired stuff, I want the rice to be cooked. I, I want everything to be freshly cooked and so on. So uh, leave that aside. The social media has just simply amplified such a ton of basic scaremongering about food. So more specifically in food, it's misinformation and it's also scaremongering. And it's like, this is dangerous. That is bad. This is bad. Don't use the fridge. Don't freeze anything. I was surprised to find out how scared people are. About what so are many the things that, that, what are the, like the major things that are on the top of your mind about things that scare people about cooking? Yeah. yeah. What are they? So, so the things that, so one is obviously fresh versus like refrigerated food. Ah. Something as basic as that. You'd be surprised by the number of people who are like, oh, but, but for, for food should not be consumed four hours after it's cooked. I said, in what world are you living in? Uh, <laughs> clearly, many people, many of these people are, unfortunately, many of these are young women who are cooking for their parents or cooking for their in-laws and their husbands. And this is what they've been told. That you're supposed to, you're supposed to cook everything fresh because our fridge is very bad and so on. And again, and it's, and it's interesting, right? So you, high school science will tell you that biological activity slows down with temperature. And uh, as long as you don't have a power cut at two or three Celsius, very little activity is going on and you can actually store food for days. Several right. days. Any NRI grad student who's been in the US <laughs> will absolutely know this to be true. Exactly. Uh, Their survival yeah, so depends on it. <laughs> on the office Sorry, table, when people would say that, they're like, wait, you got the same thing that you got yesterday for lunch. I'm like, yeah. They're like, but how? Why? I'm like, I put it in the fridge. I took out another bowl of it. Yeah. And yes. Got it to work. Like, what's the problem? And they're like, yeah. oh, how can you do that? How can you eat refrigerated food? I'm like, what kind of posh life do you live, man? <laughs> like we, yeah, I mean, we don't have like we all don't have like servants who can cook fresh food for us or a, a permanent cook or, or a mother or a wife we can exploit uh, wakes up at five in the morning to start cooking for you <laughs> exactly uh, fresh for you what world are you living in so one i mean so there, there is that right and then there is this complete irrational fear but interesting fear of sugar which is fair enough i mean again a lot of our metabolic diseases are because of overconsumption of sugar and carbohydrates yes, it's fair enough but it's very very it's very interesting you'd be surprised by the number of people who believe that their diabetic parents can eat jaggery, but not sugar. Because it's natural. Jaggery. Yeah. So right. it is natural. It is filled with minerals. I said, okay, let's debunk that. And that's the one that really got the most number of the several million views. And this made such a lot of people, a lot of these Ayurvedic types, very angry, saying that how can you promote a processed chemical product and so on. And which kind of brings me to the third thing. This whole irrational fear of chemicals. Yeah. Everything is chemicals. Um, somehow... This is a food is chemical too. It's just that it's all chemicals at the end of the day. So if you're saying that I will not eat chemicals, I mean, you have to starve. You won't be able to breathe either. Again, this you sort of, breathe is chemicals as so well. So it comes down to this sort of feeling that somehow natural is better than artificial is one. That's one yeah. level of the problem. The second level of the problem is processed is not as good as unprocessed is another part of the sort of illusion. The third thing is that somehow the same molecule, if it came from jaggery is different than if it came from white sugar. This also people believe. that suc No, that sucrose is different. It came from a natural source. So again, it's almost a very basic failure of, I guess, high school chemistry teaching. 
to say that a molecule is a molecule. It doesn't matter where it came from. And exactly. once it gets inside your body, as as far as your small intestine is concerned, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that whether it's jaggery or this, it's all being broken down to glucose and fructose, and you're getting more or less the same amount. You're getting a tiny bit more minerals from jaggery. Clearly not enough for your daily allowance and all that, but you're getting it with a ton of sugar. Absolutely. Uh, I think the, the education system is a very big part of this because people just don't understand. Like I had a very deep conversation with a colleague of mine when I was in office and she said that honey, you can, honey is, I'm having my tea with honey. I'm like, great. That's really nice. But she's like, it's better. Sure. Than I'm like, how come? So she's like, it is look it up. So I did look it up. So in her defense, honey is sweeter than sugar. So yeah. therefore you might need to use less of it slightly yeah. and it has a few other minerals etc so on the whole overall it has slightly more nutritional value as yeah. compared to sugar but yeah. not enough to really have a trade off there yeah how much are you how much honey are actually are you actually adding so exactly. therefore as a proportion 99% of that is still sugars i mean in that exactly. 1% of all the other things antioxidants and minerals yeah i think you know why common this thing is that i think the if some of we could convince people People to think in terms of denominators and their sizes, right? It's very simple. Yeah. Right? Then it sort of sticks into this thing, right? So, for example, people say white sugar is filled with chemicals. I said, okay, let's assume for a moment that that you're that it is indeed filled with chemicals. And I'm also not doubting the fact that in the making of sugar, it has to be bleached. A lot of chemicals have to be added to get it to the shape that it finally is. Indeed. Understood. So the first question is, but one, do you know what chemicals go in? That's one. Many people simply don't. They just know it's chemicals. So yeah, okay, what chemicals? That's one thing. Second thing is. Let's assume that you know what those chemicals are. How much of those residues are left in your actual sugar? Should mm -hmm. be the actual question. Exactly. It's not whether what is used in a factory that matters. See, by the way, to make for fertilizers, to make pesticides, to make literally anything, a lot of the ingredients in a factory will all be toxic. Many will be. Okay. That's exactly. just how chemical engineering works. So the point is that you can't go by what actually went in. By that logic, sodium is explosive. Chlorine is literally a bioweapon. But sodium chloride is salt. You don't go on calling salt. You don't call, call calling salt poisonous because its ingredients <laughs> were actually like dangerous and so on. So like that, I think that's number one. The next thing that happens is, is the fact that how much of the chemicals actually are in sugar. So, so you ask that question and then you point people to say that, look, according to the FSSAI, which is the Food Standards Authority of India and all that, if you're selling a packaged sugar product, by law, it is required to be 99.5% sucrose. Okay. FSSI also means if you just do a little bit of reading, you'd know that if I have a factory and if I'm making a packaged product with a ISI symbol and all these FSSI symbol and all that, yes, I know this is India. Yes, of course, theoretically, you could say you could bribe and all that. Boss, I mean, come on, this is 2022. Surely there, there has to be some quality checks in the factory. Somebody's checking something. Somebody's verifying some reports have to go. There has to be some framework of some kind of testing happening. So yeah, even exactly. if you assume it's not 100%, do you really believe that a, a Tata or a Godrej or an ITC is going to leave behind tons of chemical residue in your sugar? That's Just ask yourself that basic <laughs> question. And poison you. Okay. So, mm. so therefore, let even assume they did, but it is legally required to be tested to be 99.5% sucrose, which leaves 0.5% for all of your dangerous chemical impurities to remain. Okay. So now consider in a teaspoon of sugar, what is 0.5% of that? And also remember that any poison, there is no such thing as a poison. The dose makes the poison. That's rule zero of pharmacology is much exactly the dose makes the poison. It's so many. So for example, every spice that you eat technically mm. is a poison because the plant literally produced those molecules to kill insects that they literally did that. That's what a no, spice is. Just, a spice is literally my mind. Yes. Boom. <laughs> yeah. So why do spices exist? It's because those are flavor molecules that what we consider flavor molecules are actually antibacterial, antifungal, anti-insecticidal molecules that the plants produce to prevent animals from eating them. That's exactly what this it is. This I did not know. Right? This yeah. is amazing. Yeah. So, so, so when an onion, so different plants do it in different ways. How mm -hmm. does an onion do it? Onion has, the moment you damage, cut an onion cell, what happens is, that there's an enzyme that leaks out and then it mixes with oxygen and it sets in chain a reaction that takes about 30 seconds to happen. And everyone in the world who's ever been in the kitchen knows what happens after that. 30 seconds later, this reaction, this enzymatic reaction produces a volatile sulfurous molecule called synpropanthyl oxide, which, whose name is not important, but it's volatile. So it floats up and then mm. when it hits your eyes, it breaks down into dilute sulfuric acid. Ooh. So, so, so why do people cry? 
an onion is literally doing an acid attack on your eyes. It's very mild because you're big in this. But imagine this on a small insect. That's why insects don't go anywhere near onions. And so, so the point is that, yeah, it's, people sometimes forget that plants are living things and plants are living things that don't want to die. Okay. So, exactly. so they have their own defense mechanisms, except that humans are smart and we figured out ways in which we can use even what is ultimately a poison uh, to our own good. And so what happens is so this is what onion and that particular, that molecule is super aromatic. And so we like the smell of it. We don't mind that it makes us tear up, but we like the smell of it. And what we also know is that when you heat it up, it changes into another, this thing that's not as teary. So which is why cooked onion does not make you cry. So and so on. So you take something like clove. Clove has a molecule called eugenol, which is one of the strongest antibacterial, antifungal compounds out there. 100% pure eugenol is toxic to human beings as well. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. So so another example is nutmeg. Nutmeg is Nutmeg actually has a aromatic molecule, which again, the nutmeg plant uses to kill insects and pests and bacteria and so on. That molecule is a precursor molecule for ecstasy. <laughs> okay. so, so what happens is so, 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 so you could literally get high if you over over uh, dose on, on 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 nutmeg and not only that it'll also make you sick because it's yeah. actually pretty toxic yeah, your yeah. liver will want to throw it out the other interesting thing is that in india and grandmothers knew this not that they knew it was a methamphetamine analog and all of that but what they did know is that they would actually add it to milk a little bit to milk makes babies slightly high and puts them to sleep easier Oh, that... by the way, India has a tradition of giving babies <laughs> mild ecstasy highs. <laughs> so, that is so amazing. <laughs> yeah. So in the sense that I think so people sometimes sort of get this sense of the dose makes the poison. So that was the point yeah. that I wanted to make. So which kind of brings me to this other point, which is the other video that I made about jaggery. So, so FSA standard is that one sugar has to be 99.5% sucrose. Jaggery has to be 90% sugars. Okay. That's the rule. It usually is anywhere from 80 to 85% sucrose. Mm -hmm. 5% fructose. Okay. And the remain 10% is moisture, molasses, and all those other minerals and so on. So, so that's because it's a relatively less processed and so on. Okay. Now here's the interesting thing. If you've seen how jaggery is made, it's not made in a factory. It's made in like random, like a bunch of villages in an open pit is how it's made, by the way. Yes, exactly. I've seen that happen. And so it turns out that pure unprocessed jaggery is utterly terrible. Okay. It is dark brown in color. It's mm -hmm. messy. It's sticky. Nobody wants that. So what do our entrepreneurs, jaggery entrepreneurs do? They bleach it. Oh. They bleach it with they bleach it with sodium hypochlorite. They use anhydrous powder to reduce the moisture. And they also use a couple of other chemicals to increase the pH because jaggery is pretty high pH. It's very acidic. Right. Yeah, that's um, so and that again, so if you add that to if you add like raw, unprocessed jaggery to milk, it will curdle the milk. That's how acidic it is. You could like make paneer with it. So acids will curdle milk. So people need that jaggery to be not as acidic. So Absolutely. they do all of this. And people are still under the illusion that jaggery is unprocessed. The only difference is that a sugar is processed in a factory where there is regulation, where there are people with engineers, people with engineering degrees and quality controls and the government looking over you. And jaggery is made by people with absolutely no knowledge of this at all. And they just know by sort of a slate of hand that I need to dump one sack of sodium hypochlorate, one sack of this chemical. It's completely unregulated. And I am it not having illegal. jaggery again. That's the problem. It is not good for you. So which is it, exactly. So my point is that, look, you know what? You may know you're privileged enough, you may know a jaggery maker who you absolutely trust, mm -hmm. who perhaps makes it in the best possible way. Maybe he even gets an FSA rate. Fantastic, go for it, right? Jaggery is actually delicious in many Indian dishes. It tastes better than sugar. But if you want to say bake with it and all, it's terrible. Not great for baking at all. Yeah. It won't let your gluten, it won't really work well with baking situations and all that. So, so again, the point is that I think people, I'm not asking people to say prefer sugar over jaggery. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that all the skepticism that you healthily exhibited to sugar, meaning that what are the chemicals that are going in? How are these factories treating this? How is the quality check happening, etc. All that skepticism that all of you just showed, that's fantastic. All I'm saying is, please show it for Jagger. But don't be choosy about it. Show it for anything. And again, don't have this naturalist fallacy that if it is unprocessed, un this thing, etc. In many cases, it can be dangerous. Right. There's a reason why there is modernity and we have 8 billion people now because people didn't die from eating unpasteurized milk and die from tetanus and tuberculosis. And we, we built a modern healthcare system where we know what food safety is and so on. Yes, of course, nobody's doubting the problems of overconsumption of calories and all that, diabetes. Yes, all of that is there. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that I will eat raw milk, which is one of the most deadly, dangerous things you can do.
the whole raw milk thing went crazy in the west for quite a while insane insane they had to literally ban it yeah and it, they literally I've, had to ban the sale and transportation of raw milk i've seen that and then next thing they've got raw water happening <laughs> which is unfiltered oh, water from some random stream you know the interesting thing we have in the last 10 or 12 years 20 years we've had this switch where more people in the world died from lifestyle diseases than from infectious diseases for the first time this is sort of this is progress in the sense that for most of the last 1000 years people either died from smallpox malaria cholera dysentery and every one of these is infectious disease airborne and waterborne and we've had like the cities like london and bombay and chennai and delhi have had cholera outbreaks that killed hundreds of thousands if not billions yeah and then so you should actually see the fact that more people are dying from cancer heart disease and diabetes and so on than all of the other things as a positive people sometimes forget that so all of these newer things are all diseases of age yeah. you didn't see them in the past because people didn't live that long <laughs> they died before they could get cancer or heart disease and so on and now you have a world where you could like insert any number of stents to keep your arteries from blocking till you're like 80 85 happily and so i think i think people sometimes forget that the past wasn't great it's yeah. so there's the rosy is whole illusion fallacy of believing that this the past was amazing everybody lived very long and so on no life was nasty brutish and short people had eight kids out of which five survived one died from smallpox and two probably died from measles or, or cholera and so on yeah. and then you know young men died in wars and then if they got the slightest infection they died from tetanus and, and so on so I, i think we sometimes forget and i think that today could be fixed with a vaccine people would just simply die from people would die if you have a tooth infection because you there was no way to there was no anesthesia to pull your tooth out unless you want to do it without anesthesia which by the way many people did <laughs> oh that's horrible f- the thought there you know like there's a yes. but speaking of infectious diseases i have and onions in particular this skill the evolutionary skill of onions that you know of protecting themselves and yes. staying Yeah. for an extreme having a very long shelf life has also led to a lot of pseudo scientific ideas about onions which i encountered during the covid pandemic where there was this yeah. lady who, whose video on tiktok went viral this is before tiktok got banned of course and yeah. she basically said all you need to do to cure covid and i'm not kidding cure covid is yes. to eat chopped onions with salt sprinkled on them every yeah. day as you like a 100% cure now okay i was like in that case then 90% of people in northern india would never get covid in the first place because they do that every day for every meal <laughs> like, that if they actually have that much of onion you could also make this argument that their breath would be so bad <laughs> that social distancing won't be a problem and thus that could actually have cured uh, prevented covid <laughs> that <laughs> so that, on a lighter note that way yeah. exactly and there was actually i'm not even kidding there's an there was a whatsapp forward where yes. they spoke about actually putting raw cloves of garlic and letting them dissolve in your mouth to prevent yourself from getting covid <laughs> which does exactly the same job of social distancing plus of yep. course there's been this long there's been a very age old kind of home remedy of keeping onions under your bed which apparently absorb all bacteria from nearby so if you have a fever yeah. you're supposed to put a chopped onion under your bed and that is supposed yeah. to cure you for some reason yeah the onion is actually good at keeping bacteria away from itself from and itself it not anybody else yeah. It's it not going to just it suck. Absorb, yeah, yeah. It has no evolutionary interest in absorbing other people's bacteria. Yeah. Exactly. So th- yeah. these kinds of things, of course, yeah. led to a lot of these kind of folklorey kind of pseudo scientific yeah. ideas, and turmeric, which is even more recent, which has now gained so much attention abroad that it's yes. come back to India. Yeah, it's got, once once um, something gets Western validation, you know, we're obviously happy to say, "Oh, we did it first. Exactly. This is Ayurveda true. Yay. But have you seen anything about turmeric? Like I mean, is it genuinely beneficial because I wrote something about this a few years ago and at that yeah. point of time the jury was kind of out. Has anything yeah, It really is. Honestly speaking, so here's the thing. So one of the complicated things about nutrition is that the whole concept of a single ingredient superfood is bullshit. Okay. Yeah. And the reason it's bullshit is because it's nearly impossible to prove because this is to for you to truly prove something like this 
you would have to feed someone just that thing over an extended period of time and that would generally be called a human rights abuse you can't really experiment on human beings that way so you would have to do this on rats and so on and unfortunately we are not rats and so on so it doesn't really transfer so a lot of nutritional studies around single ingredients are almost always to be taken with a pinch of salt because you could literally prove anything to right yeah. and that you could do studies in such a way that show that oh i did this on this population and this population that was not given turmeric showed this and this population that was given turmeric showed some slight improvement in some factor and so on and you'd find that out of 10 studies maybe five of them show something else because mm-hmm. the, the problem is that it depends on who you pick what their genetics is and what their lifestyle is and so on so in general stop believing in the idea of superfoods yeah there is no doubt that turmeric per se is a fantastically healthy vegetable there is no doubt about it absolutely as much as a carrot is as much as a spinach is or a kale or broccoli or you know anything each one of these vegetables being a vegetable they bring a lot of good things to the mix they bring antioxidants to the mix they bring fiber to the mix for the most part and therefore they're not too many calories for the mo- unless it's a potato or a starchy vegetable they're not too many calories so they generally fantastic things to eat and, and so a diet that includes turmeric is good it's not bad at all but also consider that the way in which we tend to eat turmeric on a daily basis is not the fresh root yeah we have the it powder. is the it's the dehydrated powder and the process of dehydration largely will destroy a lot of the some of the really more volatile antioxidants and things like that that's just the way it is so you're only getting that dehydrated powder and not only that in one dish any good cook will tell you, you don't add more than a quarter teaspoon so therefore effectively a four member household is getting one quarter of a one quarter teaspoon <laughs> exactly so really speaking i mean whatever benefits you think you're going to get you you're not eating enough turmeric for it to even register in that of course there are people who will mix it to milk and drink at that point another question has to be asked some of the issues that happened during the i remember doctors tweeting out saying that they had to add normally when they people do surgeries so there mm-hmm. is a there's a protocol they have to have a protocol of asking the patient a following questions before they come for surgery and if they answer yes to any one of them surgery cancelled sorry please don't do that and come back and like for example before before certain surgeries you're not supposed to eat certain things if especially if the surgery is happening in your stomach and so on. so there are your doctors have these different for every surgery there's a protocol things you cannot do like if you're undergoing some surgery you can't take certain kinds of say bp medication Mm-hmm. Right? because that could mess with your heart and they don't want to deal with that and so on yeah. right so they'll have some protocols like that in place yeah. and they said that well as if this silly habit of drinking turmeric mixed with water to cure covid has become such a huge menace it become such a common thing during the early wave of the pandemic that people were coming into surgeries after drinking like turmeric water for like a week weeks on it Whoa. and what people don't realize is that turmeric also has a molecule that's a blood thinner Ah. And imagine what happens if when a surgeon when a surgeon cuts you and you're on a blood thinner and your blood won't clot. It's a nightmare. Oh, that is nasty. It's a no, complete nightmare. Won't divulge surgeon, that kind of information. Yeah. So so sur- surgeons actually need to say okay, now we need to add this to our checklist. Ask the patient, are you drinking turmeric? Is, <laughs> is now a question they've had to ask. Jeez. Before coming to surgery. So I think people sometimes forget that the thing is that these are not there are no single magic pills. Indeed. You want the benefits of turmeric? Fantastic. Generally eat very healthy food and then include fresh turmeric when you get an opportunity to in your diet. That's great. That's all you can do. You can't like just bite into turmeric uh, three times a day and expect that it'll somehow prevent Alzheimer's <laughs> or 10 years down the line and so on. That's just not how it works. And it has some serious side effects as well. In fact, I was I interviewed Dr. Abby Phillips about a year ago. and he's an absolute powerhouse when it comes to yeah, and he deals with most of the nonsense that people then end up consuming these things the first organ that gets damaged in your body is the liver and that's exactly. what he specializes in yeah exactly so yes. he's been dealing with so many cases when it comes to liver failure due to and liver toxicity when it comes to turmeric when it comes to ashwagandha when it comes to giloy yeah. because people have been chugging this by the liter throughout the entire covid period you were never meant to eat that much there is just not meant to eat that much again let's always remember there's something else that that people just simply don't realize very non con let's do go at it step by step so that even as a person who's not a science graduate can understand this safe to say we are not plants we are animals human beings are animals so point number 2 animals largely tend to share a lot of similar things when it comes to muscle structures bones and at least mammals let's just say put it that way and that's so all in the sense that the the chicken works the same way in terms of how it moves around and in terms of how it metabolizes and so on the same way as human beings Uh, it's also safe to say plants are an entirely different alien kingdom of life so 
on the one hand, animals move, plants don't move. So because plants cannot move, they have to use biochemistry to defend themselves. Animals, on the other hand, can run away or hunt and do all these things. So plants have to use purely only chemistry. So many other there are many other differences. Like, for example, salt, even in cooking, salt will dehydrate plant matter and hydrate meat. So you, you add salt, marinate, etc. meat, it makes it juicier. It's because of the salt. It's not because of all of the other things. It's The salt actually prevents muscles from losing water, which Ooh. we all know because when you exercise and run a marathon, the first thing you drink is water, sugar, and salt. Indeed. Why do we eat the salt? The salt as an electrolyte will prevent your muscles from losing further water, from dehydrate, getting dehydrated. So, so therefore, so salt has the exact opposite effect on meat as it does on, on, on plants and so on. So there are, so there is all these fundamental differences. Okay. So here's the other interesting thing though. As hunter gatherers, there was no one diet that human beings had. It's fair to say, depending on where human beings lived, in some places they were, they had to hunt a large animal and then they would eat it and then eat a lot of it in one shot and then not eat for the next three, four days. That's one form of life. The yeah. other form of life in closer to the tropics, they would dig up roots. They would eat berries occasionally, etc. In addition to insects and, and fish, if you were close to the coast and so on. Now, a question I often ask is that, that if you were left alone in a forest, if you got lost in a forest, abandoned, and you had no device with you, etc., etc., and you have to survive as long as you can till some rescuers find you. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so typical survivors, uh, I don't know who that uh, Discovery Channel guy is, but uh, Bear grills or whatever. Yeah. So how would you go about surviving? One, okay, water, yeah, yes, you can, people have some smart ideas. They'll drink off dew drops and oh, all that is fine. Oh, fair enough. Your water looks clean enough. If your immune system is strong enough, yeah, maybe you can deal with a clear water in a pond that may have some bacteria and all that. But food, what are you going to do for food? Other than eat You'd be, you'd be surprised by the number of people who say, I'll find, uh, I'll find like uh, fruits. I'll find some tree that has some fruit and I will attempt to eat that. So that's the most idiotic thing you can do. Because other than the hundred or so species of plants that human beings have domesticated, mm -hmm. the meaning of domestication of a plant means prevent it from being a poison and killing you. That's literally what it is. No. Other than these hundred species of grasses, which are corn, maize, wheat, rice, billets, and so on, the root vegetables, like all from the solanum family, the nightshade family, the tomato, brinjals, all of that is from the same nightshade family. Then you have your cucurbitae, the pumpkin family, just about for the mustard family, which is everything from cabbage to mustard to kale to cauliflower to all of that is just one family and so on. Barring these finite set of plants mm. and the few trees that have decided that apes or primates and humans are good candidates for you to eat and poop out your seed somewhere else so that the tree can grow. So that the tree has a vested interest in making it very attractive, like mangoes and a few other things and so on. Literally every other plant on earth is toxic to you. Wow. So you cannot go to a forest and say, palak I'll just cut some leaf and mark pala from it. <laughs> Please talk to Dr. Abby Phillips and find out what will happen. <laughs> every single one of them will screw your liver. Because oh. your liver will be like, sorry, I was not built for this shit. Is literally that yeah. you're not supposed to eat this thing because it has a bunch of these molecules that I've never encountered. Mm. That, that's it. Your liver and kidney cannot deal with it. And that's it. So you will literally die. So, so therefore, if you want to survive in a jungle, you want to either kill small animals and eat them raw. Okay. Because raw animals are the safest thing to eat. No bacteria. Freshly killed, freshly killed animal. Because an animal has a vested interest in being alive. So it, it won't yeah. have bacteria. So <laughs> you want to eat, you want to, so, but the moment you leave it for half an hour, yes, bacteria will start to come and so on. So freshly killed animals. That's why lions don't get like food poisoning. They eat fresh kill. <laughs> and hyenas, on the other hand, have insanely strong digestive and immune systems because they're eating rotten meat. On the other hand, the other thing you can also do is you can literally pick most insects. Oh. They leave out the wings and all of that, and you can eat every insect. It's just, it will keep you alive because it's all protein. So Bear Grylls was onto something there. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the point. I think people forget that plants are not your friends. Indeed. They are a completely alien kingdom of life that have to survive on this planet without being able to move. But they have the other superpower of being able to turn sunlight into energy, into sugars. So that's their superpower. But yeah, so we've built this relationship with a small set of plants that we use as agriculture. And by the way, those set of plants don't even, they cannot survive in the wild. Right. Yeah, and even a smaller subset of those are plants or fruits that uh, that you can actually eat raw. 
Yeah. Because exactly. most of them, the cellulose will not allow you to yeah, kind of yeah. break anything down. That's, what, that's why not. we distinguish between a vegetable and a fruit. They're all fruits, except that edible fruits are called fruits and then <laughs> inedible fruits are called vegetables. Yes. Yeah. That is, no, that, that's, as you've blown my mind multiple times in that one stretch and in this conversation. But this, like, this is, it is actually fascinating that just, you had spoken something about in your, in the Google talk that you had given about yeah. the differences between animals and plants as and like they essentially they're opposites yeah. so what are the misconceptions that you've heard about when it comes to animals especially flesh when eating yeah. meat because yes. i've heard That's a couple of really wild ones <laughs> especially from the hardcore vegetarians who say that oh, yeah. it doesn't yes. get digested it just sits yeah. in your intestines and rots and it stays yeah. there and it clogs things up which is <laughs> yeah. abjectly insane like it's I mean, protein is one of the quickest things to get digested. And it happens, it starts straight in the stomach. All the vegetables have to get help from bacteria. But I mean, anything else in that scope yeah. of things? Yeah. So, so in general, I think India has a sort of a very unique love-hate relationship with, with meat. I mean, in the sense that it's bizarre. I mean, if you take South and East India, 98% of the population is meat eating. Only 2% yeah. is vegetarian. And in the North, it's more like 70% meat eating and 30% vegetarian. So, and again, that's, again, this geography has plays a role in that. So the North and West of India is what historically the dairy belt, meaning yeah. that been very closely tied to dairy. And once you have a large dairy culture, don't need to do large-scale animal husbandry for meat. Clearly, animal husbandry is much harder and more higher effort to do. Rearing sheep and goats and cows and all of that. But once you have a large dairy culture, people can get all their essential animal amino acids from milk. So, so milk is a milk is an animal source of protein, a plant source of protein, although vegetarians do eat it. Oh, and, and so the, once you sort of eat eggs and, uh, and milk, so you create an ecosystem where you don't have to kill. And so therefore you have a, and so there is that. But even then there is a, there is this very tricky issue that you can get milk, unfortunately, only from 50% of the cow population. Yes. Right? Because the other 50% is male. Unfortunately, you can't get those guys. You're going to get something. <laughs> yeah. 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 You don't want to do that. So, so unfortunately, it's always been a very uncomfortable relationship between over history that, well, I have all these dairy cows. What am I going to do with the male? Historically, I didn't have tractors. So I'll use at least some of the males in like bullock carts and use them for plowing the land and all of that. You can't necessarily use all of them, but yeah, you still do. The uncomfortable fact was that you ended up having the lowermost segment of Hindu society. The Dalits would often, they would be the ones who, once the bulls became old or something, they would take them away and they would consume them. They would make leather goods with them and so on. So that was the untold. This thing is that I don't want to know what's happening, but hey, these people, and we would treat them like outcasts and so on. So that's been yeah. the case with North India. In South India, it's different. The people would just directly consume the beef, which is why in Kerala, and Tamil Nadu, and many of these places and Northeast and so on. But beef is just naturally consumed. If you have excess cattle, you could of course eat them. So that... That aside, there's always been this sort of notion that the rich and privileged ended up being vegetarian. So we ended up putting this idea that meat is impure. So, and it's also quite interesting. India is the only place where the food preferences of the majority are described in terms of what the minority does not eat. You know what I mean? Because nowhere else in the world do people use the term non veg. Uh, That's a very uniquely Indian term. Is that right? so? Okay. Nowhere in the world. I mean, I've traveled everywhere in the world. Nobody uses the term non-veg. That's a very uniquely Indian term. Mm. Majority are non-veg, but they have to describe their eating habits as in terms of what the minority does not eat. <laughs> uh, right? Oh. Imagine your basic food preferences <laughs> identity being based on what some upper caste fellow does not eat. Right. Wow. No, everywhere else. Why is would you accept food so, and vegetarians? Right. Yeah. So, so in fact, so I went to a was at a wedding reception in Kerala again. Mm -hmm. If you last few years, is, so there's this small growing movement amongst the young people that we've got to change all of these things. So the wedding reception had like normally a veg counter and a non-veg counter. Yeah. Uh, so it basically said veg and regular. <laughs> I love it. If I was to get married, right. so I would definitely do that. <laughs> you do that in yeah, Trivandrum and so on. So, but yeah, so on the one hand, so there is the notion of impurity that's always been associated with this. And over time, this has sort of begun to give rise to a whole bunch of bits about meat being hard to digest and so on. See, on the one hand, of course, yes, off carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Proteins are the hardest to digest because proteins are, I mean, just purely physically the largest complicated molecules 
that you eat because sugars are like just glucose that you can directly use sucrose is just glucose fructose split it you can use starch is just polymerized glucose you can just break it you can use fats nothing you just have to break the glycerol down to fatty acids you can use so yeah. in terms of the digestive effort that you need to put proteins are generally the hardest to digest but again as i said none of this business about sitting in your small intestine and rotting and all of that happens proteins are all completely done by your small intestine nothing is wasted by the way see the thing is that when you actually eat plants most of the stuff you can't digest yeah very true that's fiber that's cellulose and your body takes everything and then all the rest that it cannot digest goes into the large intestine where trillions of bacteria are waiting chalo aa gaya buffet and then <laughs> they eat so your gut health is based on how much plants you eat because you're feeding them with plants that's basically exactly right? so it's a very interesting symbiotic relationship the, so the interesting thing is that i i still need to read papers on what happens if you're on one of these ultra carnivorous diets what happens to your gut microbiome will it be now a different kind of gut microbiome that is able to live off whatever you can't digest in meat but in general you can pretty much digest everything in meat so it remains that yeah. would be very anyway, interesting that aside So this is one sort of common idea that meat takes long, is complicated. It's very hard to digest. And all. Yes, of course, all proteins are hard to digest. That's true of dal. It's true of it's true of eggs. It's true of anything. So that's just how okay. proteins are. Okay, and soy and all of that. The other common misconception also is that this idea that meat will rouse your passions and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> I haven't people heard that. Non-veg. <laughs> yeah, no, no. People who eat non-veg tend to get angry and, uh, and all of that. So the historical idea is that Kshatriyas ate non-veg. That's why they were warriors and then so on. Okay. So there is there is also that idea amongst the people that meat rouses passions and make you angry and so on. Which again, which again is silly. But but it's interesting. So that list, that tamasic list, which includes meat, also includes onion and garlic. by the way right uh-huh. so so the higher so there's a classification of satvic foods hmm? which are healthy can be eaten all the time yeah. rajasic which is meant for largely meat based and is meant for say kings and warriors because they need like physical strength and so on so that's more protein heavy and but that you only include certain cuts of meat and all that and certain animals and okay. tamasic which is like organ meats onion garlic and all that amazingly if you really see the list of things that are tamasic those are like the most nutritious healthy things as per <laughs> modern science and probably the tastiest as well yeah yeah <laughs> i mean organ meats can be a bit of a quiet taste but yeah but in general yeah so it, it is very much super nutritious at the very least onion garlic and organ meats and all of these other smaller birds and lizards and things like that so and but the point is that i think that we've had this sort of somehow because the the ecosystem is largely sort of controlled by people who have historically been at least for the last 2000 years vegetarian and so there's a bunch of these sort of random bits that have been perpetrated about meat and yeah. so it's quite fascinating so you think about government schools public schooling almost by the 1920s itself the south had realized that one way to get poor people to send their kids to school is to give them food in school so that's one less one less mouth to feed and so they'll send the kids to school and this has been going on for the last 100 years and over time that meal has also gotten better it now includes eggs and all of that and so and you'd be surprised that many of the north indian states do not give eggs in their midday meal in schools why because i think there's a, the preference for it to be vegetarian i mean again it's this idea that somehow the poor are less likely to be vegetarian because vegetarian sources of protein are expensive indeed and you have to have yep. large quantities yeah. of yeah. Like yeah. i mean it. as i pointed out in one video that for a villager say who's a agricultural laborer living mm. in a shack of some kind a kilogram of tur dal is like some 140 rupees or something okay oh but but a goat or a chicken is free Be- because they reproduce it and they f- they just eat wherever and they reproduce they give you eggs as long as you know how to maintain that ecosystem you get protein for free as that long is- as you had as, as long as you like inherited like one goat or a, a, a two goats and two chicken you can basically manage a small household their protein needs again it's still not enough but you won't starve the cost the cost to you is zero mm, exactly. let's put it that way right and again we're really talking about so the, the and a lot of people got very angry saying that how can you say that animal animal husbandry is not uh, sustainable again your people are going by throwing words without understanding what it means animal husbandry is giant commercial farm caged hens huge cattle farms in the us that's not what we're talking about we're talking about the 70% of indian farmers who mm. basically have like small holdings and like a couple of animals yeah very true so in india yeah. the, what do you think is the the ecological impact of, of the all the animals that we are using commercially like we are primarily consuming goats and chickens yeah. and fish with a little bit of pork thrown in 
but yeah, no, I'm beef too. I'm that kind uh, of the south, the south and the east, the south and the east consume fair amount of beef actually. So there is no there are no political restrictions on beef consumption. Beef, of course, traditionally it's again it's, it's still not consumed by the upper caste Hindus, but it is definitely consumed by Christians and Muslims and also the Dalits and so on. And in Kerala, everyone eats beef, so that's uh, and, and the northeast as well. So this is not a so in a sense, see, I think it's quite interesting. So it is on the one hand, large scale animal husbandry is unsustainable for the planet. Okay. So Absolutely. it is the second largest producer of carbon. Okay. After the automobile, uh, tr- you know, fossil fuel industry. Yeah, yeah. After fossil fuels, it's food. It's basically animal husbandry, which is the largest producer of greenhouse gases. And the bulk of that is actually the beef industry in like Brazil and in and, and US and Canada yeah, yeah. And, and China and so on. Right? The biggies. Now, India is a very weird place in that sense. We have one third of the world scattered, but our beef consumption is largely low, but we are the largest exporter of beef in the world. Exactly. We are the largest. Yeah. What are you going to do with all of those male cattle? Yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah. they have to be exported. So for all the hypocrisy about saving cows, we are the largest exporter of beef. That's number one. Okay. And the second thing is that the other thing is that most, we don't really have, of course, there are now in, to supply the growing demand as we are becoming wealthier and wealthier. There are poultry farms that are using caged chickens and all of that. That again, as it continues to increase, it is going to become unsustainable at some point. But again, chicken is still not as much of a problem. If you look at the carbon cost, ratio of the calories that you need to feed to how much calories you get, okay. it's like super inefficient compared to like your poultry and so on. That said, what if you think about, there are no industrial mutton farms, there are no industrial cattle farms and so on. But we still have one third of the world's cattle. And I spoke, I was speaking to an environmentalist who gave me this, again, very uncomfortable. It might either make your audience very angry, it might blow their mind, or it might do both. Which is that he said, look, at the end of the day, your couple of things. One is that grain-fed cattle specifically tend to produce a lot more of that methane, which is a problem because they're not grass-fed. Their stomachs were designed for grass, but you're feeding them grains because you want them to grow fat fast. And so they end up producing, farting a lot more methane and all of that. In India, it's largely grass-fed because it's not like, you know, but not just grass-fed, Cows in cities are not just largely eating like garbage. It's not like they're eating like pristine pastures and all that. They're largely eating garbage for the most part. Okay. And the other thing is that other uncomfortable fact is that a cow, as long as it's a cattle, as long as it's living, is generating greenhouse gases. So, mm-hmm. so he says that technically speaking, India would reduce net emissions if it started consuming more beef because you'd kill those animals rather mm-hmm. than let them live 40 years. Now, with this caveat in mind, but if beef, beef becomes so popular that you then end up increasing the population of cattle that you have, then yeah. you're going to increase emissions. So it's sort of like this curve. It says that India is here. You could be here. So, so that's, that's the point I wanted to make. It's saying that, look, if, if at all there's anything, there's, <laughs> there is, there's an argument to consume, to consume more beef <laughs> up to a point. Exactly. We don't want to get too fond of it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, there's one more thing which I've been trying to figure out for years actually i've asked everybody i've i can think of i asked my barber i've asked my wife i've asked my parents-in-law what is your garam food and thanda food the tasir seer or you know yes. however it's pronounced yes. have you figured out what that is no it's a, see I, this is something that actually me and dr abby phillips collaborated a while back and we did a post on instagram joint post oh, nice. on on why this is bullshit. And it obviously got a lot of angry comments and so on. But again, as I said, no, I think, so see, it's hard to, it's never a great way to communicate science to someone by first invalidating their traditional belief systems. It doesn't work that way. Oh, fair enough. So I'm more interested in understanding where this classification came from and why exactly. it came That's about. what I want to know. Uh, yeah. And then, then, then. So, so for the most part, if you look at every traditional medical system in the world, be it European, the pre-modern era, Renaissance, pre-Renaissance era medicine, Greek medicine, Yunani, which is sort of more yeah. uh, Arabic medicine. And so it's on. become Arabic. Yeah. Arabic, Greek, Greek, Arabic, yeah. sort of. Yeah. So that's what Yunani, Yunani is, uh, Greek and so on. Uh, yeah. Then you have, within India, you have Ayurveda and Siddha, which are both different, by the way. So the Siddha more in the south and Ayurveda more in the north. Yeah. Uh, and then you have other tribal systems of medicine and you have the Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine and Japanese and so on. So you have all of these systems, uh, African and, and so on. So obviously, every one of these things, every one of these societies had a vested interest in trying to understand the human body. And they would do different things. So they would observe, they would see what works, what kind of food works, what doesn't work and so on. They would cut up cadavers to see what's happening when somebody died and so on. And so there there were ways in which they attempted to do these things. And again, I think what happens is that there is only so much you can understand about the body without having a microscope and looking at it at the cellular level. Yeah. So, So in the history of medicine, 
the microscope represents that pivotal shift. Mm-hmm. What the microscope essentially does is that all of a sudden it says, oh, okay. So there is life is actually made up of smaller units. Okay. And one, it turns out it's not just us, but there are all these other things like bacteria and fungi. And by the way, apparently almost all of the problems we know, we only understood then that happened because of these other single cell things that upset our entire system. Indeed. Right? And it took like four or 500 years to then figure out, oh, there's an immune system and this overwhelms that or it doesn't overwhelm that. Uh, so therefore, you could then design a vaccine to exactly do this and so on. Or that, by the way, this pathogen releases this particular chemical and therefore I can give you something that neutralizes that. Or I can design a molecule that upsets the, that gets into the cell, manages to get through the cell wall of this particular bacterium. So that's why you have antibiotics and so on. Yeah. And so you have all of that. Every one of these things required you to first understand that life is made up of cells. Cell is their single sort of unit of life. And then the germ theory of disease. Indeed. It's, Therefore, give birth to the germ theory of disease, which is very central. So before germ theory of disease, people had to just make intelligent guesses. And to be fair to them, they built models that worked for them. I mean, worked in the sense of worked well as much as it, as well as it could. Indeed. And so, so one of the, so the European model was that things are caused by bad air. Like, so in fact, literally malaria means bad air. So they blame malaria on bad air. So that's what it's called malaria. And then so on. So again, that's like sort of very getting kind of close to Maybe germs and so on, but not quite. Because they didn't really know what germ it was. And they really couldn't justify what was good air versus bad air. But which is why a lot of the older ideas of when people were sick, they would be sent to the countryside to get good air. Ah. That's the whole concept of sanitariums and all of that. Came in outside the city. Hospitals were outside the city. Most important thing was for you to get good air and so on. Mm. Helped in some cases, but clearly didn't help in many other cases if the pathogen was inside, already inside. And, yeah. so. and then you so start missing. Like that, I think, you know, so, so what happens is, yeah. So what happens is that you you then start, obviously, that you're analyzing food, for example. You eat certain foods. You, you're you observing the human being go through their motions and so on. And you find that certain things cause, like, say, acid reflux. Right. And obviously, I think digestion of protein also is thermogenic, meaning that it just generates heat. When you have to break down amino acids and turn to urea to prevent ammonia from building up in your blood, that reaction generates heat, which is why if you eat like a full steak, you'll start sweating because yes, your body temperature will rise and therefore your brain will make you sweat to bring that temperature down. It's all thermostasis uh, to keep your temperature even so on. So it's just that you'd observe things like that. You would observe the fact, for instance, like a ginger sort of burns your throat, for example. You would observe that pepper also burns your throat. You would observe chilies. Uh, You wouldn't observe chilies because chilies didn't come to India until the 18th, 17th century. So that's a separate thing. But pepper and ginger and so on. And in fact, you would also have made observations about what was seasonal, what was not. And then things that were seasonal are far more likely to be fresher and things that were not seasonal and so on. Over time, you ended up with this classification of your idea was that it, this is hot and this is cold and you retroactively observed phenomena and then you came up with a set of com- combinatorial ideas that explain those things. Uh. So, so you don't mix fish with dairy, for example. You don't mix fish with dairy. You can say, yeah, then you retroactively say fish is cold, that is hot or whatever it is, but you don't therefore mix. But if you really look at it practically, both fish and dairy are notoriously can spoil very easily if you didn't have refrigeration, which nobody had 2000 years ago. And so the last thing you want to do is combine both of those things back in the day. And then so on. So basically, many of these sorts of rules, so things like combining acidic things with milk again will curdle the milk for the most part. Exactly. Again, you didn't have ways to, you didn't have really ways to preserve it and many things like that. So therefore, that's how you came up with this sort of random classification. It's seemingly random because the problem is that it, because we now have refrigeration, you can throw out all of those rules, literally. Yeah. <laughs> you can throw out all those combination rules and <laughs> Now, because we know the germ theory and we know cells, Mm -hmm. we also know thermostatic equilibrium and all that. We also know that what you eat cannot change the temperature of your body. Absolutely cannot. Because if it could, you'd be dead. It cannot. (laughs) Exactly. We are warm-blooded creatures for a reason. So what you eat cannot change the pH of your blood, Mm -hmm. which is why alkaline diets are bullshit. Me and Science Science is Dope actually did a collaboration video on that on his channel as well. Ah, so I've got a couple of videos. And, and, on that. Yeah, correct. So likewise, so likewise, you know, what you eat cannot change the temperature of your body. So therefore, what might have originally been a metaphorical classification of that, so that you have some com- combination rules, meaning that you can't combine this, you can't combine that. <laughs> now it's just become this absolute this thing that this is hot, this is cold. You must not mix hot and cold. People have lost the context for why people did those things in the past. They did not have refrigeration. They did not understand the germ theory of disease and so on. You understand all of that. You have no business. Now, I could, I would actually argue that the people who applied it back in the past, they were being sensible about it because that's the only knowledge they had and they applied it consistently. 
you have no business doing this okay. because you okay. live today because you've been vaccinated and you've been vaccinated okay. because those people didn't believe in hot and cold theories they believed in the germ theory of disease right? <laughs> yeah. and, and and so on so it is basically that so therefore those classifications may have been useful at a point they're not useful anymore in the sense that you can eat anything you want at any point of time you mm. can combine anything you want at any point of time it doesn't really matter what obviously matters is how much you eat and what is your ma- macro mix that right? you have enough fiber you're getting enough protein that's what matters more other than these small specific things which by the way back in the day might have been a life or death thing because it could have caused you food poisoning many other things that could have happened which they yeah. didn't know why and so they just said oh it's because of hot and cold ah uh, okay no thanks for clearing that up that was fantastic and i think we just i think that's a good place to kind of wrap things up for today i'm sure i'll get back in touch with you for a lot more because there's i'm going to wait for our people who are watching to kind of send in a few questions if they have any sure. and then we can do this all over again this was this has been by far one of the most fascinating conversations i've had yet on this channel super So thank you so very much for coming on. This was absolutely Super. fantastic. Where can people find you? Where can people get in touch with you, ask you questions, watch your content? So underscore masala lab on Instagram, Krish Ashok on Twitter, LinkedIn. If you want to ask me IT related questions, <laughs> are you on YouTube by any chance? YouTube, yes, just Krish Ashok on YouTube as well. Yes. All right, wonderful. And of course, you have a book called Masala Lab. Masala Lab, yes, which right? is available so- on Amazon. Yes. wonderful i'll put a link of with of that in the description and so guys that's the end of the interview for now if you like that if you found that blew your mind which it definitely did me i have been doing this <laughs> several times today so definitely give me that like and uh, thank uh, as a thank you for krish to come on the channel and please subscribe if you want to watch more content like this more interesting interviews and find out more things that will blow your mind definitely hit the subscribe button ring the bell icon and i will see you in the next one thank you so much for watching and thank you krish for joining us on rational interviews i'll catch you later bye bye